I would like to say that I really believe there is no wrong way to meditate. The, the only mistake that we can make is that we don't do it consistently because we always have an opportunity to learn. And probably the worst meditations in many ways are the best meditations. And we should really keep that in mind. If somebody says that they're having a difficult time meditating, um, meditation is a reflection of their daily activity, their daily lives, what's happening in their lives. So if they're having trouble meditating at, at a particular moment, like now, it's because there's some um, scattered things going on, you know, in, in our minds. And that doesn't mean um, that it's bad. Um, and actually, I would go so far as to say that there's no such thing as a bad meditation. There are many, many different ways to meditate. And I know myself, again, when I was just starting to meditate, I've been a little background for, for some of you. Um, I've been teaching um, for about two decades now. Uh, I mean, like in a, in a formal setting, you know, like groups an individual is you know about tw about 20 years i've been teaching meditation and i got a late start practicing so i started actually practicing about 10 years before that so about like 19 1990 a little bit before a little bit before you know like the later 80s so I, I got a late start compared to a lot of people when i first started meditating i had a lot of questions as i s spoke of earlier um but when I meditate, started meditating every day, regardless of whether I felt like I was doing it correctly or not, it made all the difference in the world for me. And that's when I really, really started falling in love with meditation. And only the only reason I fell in love with it is because I saw the benefit in it. I mean, the, the, real, the real benefits of it came out because it was done every day. And if I remember correctly, I was doing it about 20 minutes uh, every morning. Uh, and I was making notes, I was journaling. And um, it wasn't Vipassana, you know, Vipassana practice is a very easy practice or what we call Vipassana. Um, Vipassana is when you um, uh, choose a um, meditation object, generally, it might be your breath. And you, you focus on that. And you notice that your awareness has gone adrift we could say and uh, maybe it usually goes we could relate it to going into the past or the future and we notice that and we bring it back to the object and um, i'm not going to go into the, the deep deep explanation of vipassana but that's the general practice um, we are aware of our thoughts we're not discriminating against our thoughts or anything like that we are um, sometimes even noticing them but and and in such a way that uh, we can uh, be aware that they're there and without letting, allowing them to really interfere with our meditation practice, ideally. This is Vipassana. Vipassana can also lead into jhana. Jhana is a very deep concentration practice where we are just forced, really literally trying to force things out, initially force, force out these hindrances, um, these uh, any kind of uh, ill will or any kind of negativity within the mind or or the body in in jhana the body fades away and the mind becomes very very intently concentrated on a single point and that could be the breath as well and then we fall into these deep states of concentration um, but there are many many other ways to 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 constant or to meditate and we've been working with quite a few of those um, on Wednesday night here. Um, one of them is, yeah, you know, uh, guided meditation is not necessarily Vipassana. And we do guided meditation here every Wednesday night. We also, we have a long space for, for silent meditation, but uh, the guided meditation is not really Vipassana. That The Buddha didn't teach that technique. Anyway, I wanted to speak about meditation from the viewpoint that we cannot we cannot do it wrong if we do it consistently and as a teacher and there's some teachers out here um, 
right now that I'm speaking to, that's that's our job as a teacher is to remind people to practice consistently. And then that's daily, not necessarily for long periods, maybe, you know, for for an hour a day or something like that, but not necessarily, but just to do it consistently. And if a person says that their meditation isn't working well, that's probably the reason because it's not consistent. If they're saying that their meditation isn't going well, uh, even though they're meditating on a daily basis, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It just means that that is one of the junctions that they're at in their in their practice, that they're pro they're the the ability for us to go within through the practice of meditation is really a phenomenal thing and the fact is is that the ego absolutely hates meditation the e ego hates meditation because the ego the ego's job is to find something that it's not comfortable with and try to push it away and seek for more, more uh, fulfillment again and again, just seeking and looking, you know, more popularity, more money, uh, usually something in the future, something better in the future. That's the ego's, the ego's job. The ego is a state of, it's a part of our mind. You know, we could actually say that there's, there's the ego within us that is causing virtually all the discomfort, all the pain and all the suffering that we are experiencing, the, you know, the, the anger from the past and the fear of the, the future is the ego itself. And so we have an opportunity and we have a choice of whether we want to be happy or not. And that is through the understanding of, of this thing called the ego. So we could say that there's the ego, and then the flip side of that, if we, we humans like to find opposites, you know, and we could say that the opposite of that, that ego, and I know a lot of people are kind of looking for it right now, what would that opposite be? But it's, it's quite simple. It's presence. It's present, that present moment reality, which is just the opposite of that seeking and trying to uh, find that next uh, point of satisfaction, that next thing that's going to to make everything a little bit better. And that's why the ego hates meditation. And that's why we do it. Um, but it can be very, very tricky. It's very easy to skip a day or skip two days or skip three days and not get back into it. Um, and that's that's one of the dangers the the dangers of uh, of having a, a meditation practice is forgetting that it's very easy to to be consistent. We just do it each day. Um, a little bit more about the ego. Uh, it it is a part of the mind. It's something that everybody has. And when we start to awaken, uh, we could use the word enlightenment if you if you like. I like to use the word the word awaken because it's kind of it's it's very similar to the word of being aware, and this awareness is really key. So the more we become aware of the ego, the more we awaken, and it's, it's really quite simple. You know when somebody starts to see clearly. Um, I listened to a song this morning. Uh, uh, I think it's I Can See Clearly Now is the name of the song. Um, I was thinking Otis Rush, but I'm not sure. I don't think that's who did it. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. So there's an awareness of what the hindrances are, what the problems are, what the difficulties are, and that awareness is actually spotting and figuring out the ego, and that the ego is what causes us to be unhappy. And so the, 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 the key here is not to see the ego as an opposition or an enemy to us, but as something that is a part of us and something that 
that everybody experiences. We can't, you know, find the ego and grab it by the shoulders and tear it up and get it out of there. You know, uh, if it was that easy, there'd be all sorts of classes on how to do that. But it's more about understanding the ego, working with it, and that is through awareness. Awareness, that word awareness is knowing. It's knowing what is happening. If we are aware of something, we know that it's, it's, it's going on. We, if we're aware of something within our body, we know what's happening within our body. That awareness is very, very key in our, uh, our uh, awaking, um, in our uh, eventual enlightenment, full enlightenment. So all of this is you know, related to our meditation practice. And um, we should, as I've said for a couple of decades now, we should be very, very consistent with our practice and you know, not uh, let it falter. Um, I've been guilty of it. I, I know uh, many, many, you know, just about all my students have been, um, and people I know have been, you know, guilty of, of um, letting their meditation practice get a little bit soft, we could say, you know, where we miss it a day or two. And, um, uh, or sometimes that can turn into a week, or sometimes we just meditate once a week. Sometimes we just meditate on Wednesday nights or something like that. Um, I would always encourage everybody to have a really good solid home practice and maybe something like this once or twice a week, just to to remind themselves that they're not alone, you know, in this, um, this practice of meditation, which is a the the surest way to to kind of pat down that that ego, um, which is really the source of of our unhappiness. You know, I often talk about the past being anger and the future being fear. You know, these are just small parts of of what can cause, you know, just aspects of the mind that cause unhappiness. And ego is all mind. It's all mind stuff. Um, None of this mind stuff we can see, and we can't see the ego. We can see, maybe see traces of it. But anytime we feel as if we're not, we're not good enough, we're not pretty enough that we're that we don't have a we a good enough relationship with people or that we don't have enough money or a good enough job anytime that we feel inferior um even uh sometimes it could work the other way we might have a, a ego because if something is 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 working in our favor and when it doesn't work in our favor all of a sudden we feel uh, inferior, all this, you know, this, how all this can kick in. We just have to be very, very aware of all these things and realize that, that it is the ego. And it's just a part of, of being uh, a human. And again, I say, we have to recognize that the ego is this, this negativity within the mind. The ego loves negative thoughts. And that's why I say that it could be singular or global. Um, if the, there's a, if the glow, if people in the world are in this, um, in this kind of gloom and doom, uh, situation, uh, in, in their, their thinking, it can, it can affect a, a large numbers of people that we, so we have to be very, very careful of that. I heard one lady a little while ago talk about how they can, uh, they can fight that and fight some things that they don't uh, agree with, you know, like um, things that they hear on the media. And she said one of the ways to fight it is through prayer. And I thought that was great, um, rather than actually standing out on the street with a, with a sign saying, we don't like this anymore. Uh, she said another method would be through prayer. And for us meditators, um, it could be through meditation as well, because we are in a way we're fighting the ego, but not with fists and knives and guns and that type of thing, but through identification and through awareness. And that I really believe that's the best that everybody could do. If we all understood the ego from the standpoint of how it causes our suffering, it would be a completely different world. That's why ego hates meditation, because that's true with meditation too. If everybody was a meditator, it would be a, a completely different world that we lived in. 
I think we should probably do a little bit of a meditation here. Um, I'll kind of hold, uh, if you have any questions, just kind of write them down. I don't, I don't, sus uh, I don't um, suggest you hold them in your mind while we're trying to meditate, um, but we can open it up for, um, we'll stop the meditation a little, little bit before eight and see if there's any questions from anybody. This will be a partially guided meditation um, along the lines of some of the things I spoke on here. And then there will be a, a, a great deal of silence or a, some, some deal of silence, some period of silence. We'll see how we are time wise. And um, I'm going to try, uh, I see everybody's, most everybody is muted. It looks like everybody is muted. Okay. And I appreciate that. Uh, I just don't want anybody to get disturbed. So I suggest you please make yourself comfortable, and that could mean sitting on the floor, sitting in your chair, whatever it takes. And gently close your eyes. Take a nice deep breath and slowly exhale. You can do this a few times, a few nice deep breaths. Just kind of check in with yourself. Notice what kind of feeling, what kind of mood, emotion you're experiencing. Just remind yourself that you're here to meditate. You're not here to, to bring along any of the things that you've been doing throughout the day, even though they've been maybe wonderful things. Just set aside everything from the past as much as you can. You can pick it up later when we're done meditating. That's the number one reason that meditation is such a huge stress reducer. It's because we're immediately able to let go. We're letting go of our memories, our duties, all the functioning of the past. And if we can do that alone, we're more than halfway there. Some people like to connect that with the breath. Every time they exhale, they're letting go of the past. Not that the past is bad or that it's not useful. There's some very wonderful memories of the past. There's some very valuable lessons that we learned in the past. It's just that at this moment right now, we give ourselves permission to let go of that. Using the breath as your meditation object, ask yourself where you feel the breath the most. You feel the movement of the breath at the tip of the nose, the throat, somewhere within the lungs perhaps. Where do you feel the breath? Try to use that as your focal point if you like. And at some point you may wish to count the breaths to give your meditation a little added boost for a busy mind. 
Noticing the inhalation and the exhalation. And some people may wish to use a mala to count the breaths or something like that. And that works very well too. A string with beads. When we think of the ego and what it is and what it can do, it's a, a part of us. It's not an enemy. It's something that we have to work with. The more we become familiar with it and aware of it, the higher our vibration with life, the more we enjoy life. Anytime there's negativity in our life, anytime we have a, a negative emotion, a low state, a bad feeling of some type, it's the ego. And this is where the ego is very comfortable. The opposite of the ego is the present moment present moment is our our true self our Buddha nature if you will when we feel wonderful and happy very content perhaps we're doing something we really enjoy perhaps we're just meditating being quiet that is presence, the present moment. If we're thinking about how adequate we've been in the past, some mistake we made, how angry we can be at ourselves or at others, this is the aspect of the ego. If we're striving and struggling for something better in the future, we find ourselves being cautious and afraid of the future. Fearful that we might lose control somehow. This is the ego, particularly in the area of control. Instinct and intuition are not the ego. And fulfillment is not the ego. And the more we are aware of these things, the the clearer our life is, our purpose in life, our reason for being, and our level of happiness. The reason they call it presence, or particularly the present moment, is because there's no element of time to seek towards or to think back to. Nothing to work for or to strive for. There's no seeking uh, in, in the future or regrets of the past. This is a state that we can function in as, as well as practice in. 
formal meditation is a wonderful practice to abide in this state of presence. And practices uh, such as different mindfulness practices or being in nature, for example, are excellent ways to practice presence while in motion and doing. So the formal practice at this moment, breathing in, breathing out, focusing on the breath, and being very much aware of where our thoughts are, or our thoughts, period. Thoughts of the past or the future are not harmful or bad. If we're aware of them, then they they don't have that impact. We don't have to identify with them. Once we identify with them, that's the ego getting its way. My education, my income, my friends, my family, my toys, It all starts when we're very young child, children, my mommy, my daddy. And as young children, we learn that being upset, being unhappy works. We cry because we want something and we get it. And if we do that again and again, it's a learned response. And that too is the ego at work. And for that reason, dissatisfaction can be a habit can be a way of life. People can sing the blues and actually enjoy it. And they do. So bring your attention to the breath. Notice when the mind wanders. And just be aware you're learning so much about yourself by sitting in silence and going within, understanding the nature of the mind, which is understanding the ego and understanding presence. Allow yourself to rest in that presence. When your attention wanders, simply and gently bring it back with the intention that you are going to experience this presence, this true nature, this bliss in many cases. Gently breathing in and out.
and stay with the breath. Notice how the mind wants to wander off. Very natural. And with acceptance and patience, just gently bring it back, bring your attention back to the breath. And there you'll find presence.
focusing on the breath. Take a little deeper than normal inhalation. Bring some energy into the body. Kind of bring yourself back to the room that you're in. Notice how the body feels. Check in again. Notice any states. You surely touched touched on presence while you were meditating. If it was quiet, body was relaxed, mind was calm. See how just this little taste of it helps. How do you feel now compared to the way you felt when you started meditating? Let's check in. Take some mental notes. And it's noticing the small benefits and sometimes the big benefits of meditation that allows a person to come back to it again and again. like to bring your hands together in front of your heart, bring your palms together. May each one of us and all beings be well, happy, and peaceful. May no harm come to us. May no difficulties come to us. May we all meet with spiritual and worldly success. And may we have the patience, courage, and the understanding to meet and overcome any problems, any difficulties that we might face in life. Thank you. I hope with that practice, everybody, and I think um, the, with the population I'm working, I'm fortunate enough to work with, everybody understands that the uh, ego does not like meditation. <laughs> it doesn't uh, like that frequency. So you did well you know, by, by, by doing it every time you meditate. Um, you're understanding yourself at a deeper level because you're understanding the aspect of the ego. Um, earlier I said if anybody had any questions to kind of write them down to remember them and if um, you feel free to unmute uh, unmute your microphones if you like if you have any questions anything you want to add or anything like that. You mentioned that we all have ego, um, you know, and I guess I'm, I've been reading this book um, that you might find interesting. You might be familiar with it, but it's uh, Why Buddhism is True. It's mm. a evolutionary psychologist, um, you know, like meditator. But, um, you know, so it's a lot of the uh, kind of uh, support for the teachings of of the Buddha as as um, supported by modern psychology um, coming around you know catching up several thousands of years later I guess but yeah. um, you know when when you talk about the ego I one of the, one of the focuses that I I really appreciated that was an early focus of the book was the whole not self sermon of the Buddha and you know. Um, when you when you mentioned that we all have ego, which is obviously undeniably true, um, is the ego a delusion? You know, is the ego the sense of self? Is are we talking about a delusion that we all have? <laughs> and you know, uh, uh, you know, and uh, definitely, I know that the ego is is my greatest hurdle to enlightenment that I don't think I'll ever overcome. You know, um, so I guess I'm just kind of curious. Um, you know, what your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, the, the question comes up, like how much ego 
do we need in order to survive? And you know the, that what that question kind of relates to is is um, the fight or flight. You know um, the the protection that the ego might provide for us, but it's it's more like that instinct and in, in intuition that is a that could be a guiding factor for us. Um, so as wh- while until we are fully enlightened there is that aspect of the ego or the the self you know there is selfing involved when uh when one is fully enlightened it is said that um that is what disintegrates or that that is what is um is not there anymore um it's it's almost like uh, it's almost like we're kind of shaking hands with it or at first you know, there's a there's a, an opposing force, and if somebody's very very upset and has difficulties in their life, it, it's a it's kind of almost like a fight against the ego. And then if one wakens up and and kind of sometimes it happens in older age, sometimes it happens spiritually. We just kind of shake hands with the ego, and and everything is it's understood. You know, it's it's all right. You know that we walk uh, through this world hand in hand with it like it's a, an opposing force that we make friends with and then if there's full enlightenment uh within this lifetime uh like the buddha that that's uh, could be compared to just like saying you know say la vie or you know g- goodbye to the ego um because it's it just doesn't have any power at all i mean this whole thing isn't an illusion um you know these are yeah these are words that we you know, phrases and words that we use to define, you know, some aspect of, of, uh, you know, what Eckhart call, totally calls the pain body, for example, and different aspects of, of us. Um, and we could take that a step further in, you know, is, is all of this an illusion? You know, are we, you know, what, how much of a matrix are we actually in, you know? So that's a tough one. You know, Lyle, <laughs> is it is an illusion? Yeah, it's sometimes. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think um, <clears throat> I think that um, you know, for you know, that's you know, there's there's kind of contradictions too, I guess, in a way, or just complexities. Um, that's probably something that um, I don't know if if you had a hard time coming to grips with or understanding in your in your uh, study of Buddhism, you know, uh, but I. I, I, I also kind of found in reading this that it's like, what, what did he mean by that? Did he mean like literally that there's there's no self, or was it used a tool to point out you know how much of your perception is you know wrong you know that that you you can change you know so yeah and and it seems it seems you know with all this kind of middle way teaching that it does seem that there's absolutely no self at all it does seem not so middle you know it seems kind of extreme uh, you know so that's interesting yeah yeah that's it you know it's a it's a really deep subject um the thing is is you know are is it, all of this an illusion are we in, are each of us individually um uh, are we thinking ourselves into existence you know, we could take it that far. And then there's middle ways to middle points uh, to that as far as um, how much of an existence there is, you know. We'll, we'll have a discussion on that sometime. Yeah, we'll get into it. Sounds like a good book that you're reading, though. Sounds like it's bringing up some good topics and stuff. And we do this every Wednesday. Uh, please uh, use the same uh, uh, link and come and join us every Wednesday. I think it can be a really good part of your practice. Um, love to see you. And if there's anything that I can help you with individually, just shoot me an email or uh, you can try to give me a call, but uh, email is usually better. And they, uh, try to, try to uh, uh, chat with you or, or help you out any way I can, whatever it might be. Okay. So yeah, thanks, Lyle. Thank you, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you next week. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Love you. See you Wednesday. Bye. Bye-bye.